Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Detention. We are super excited tonight that we have Coach Jesse Moore on with us. Uh, who is Jesse Moore? Well, he just might be the best coach that you've never heard of. Uh, Jesse is the sole proprietor of Moore Performance Coaching, uh, and he has assembled a lifetime of competing and coaching, beginning with track and cross country while he was growing up in the great state of California. After some injury plagued years in collegiate running, uh, Jesse headed to graduate school to study exercise science and there he discovered cycling, spending the next eight years rising through the ranks on the California Giant specialized cycling team uh, where he competed on the NRC circuit. In 2012, Jesse turned to our sport, putting up a 1108 at his as at his Ironman debut in Ironman St. George. He made two trips to Kona over the next few years, cracking the top 10 in his age group in 2015, posting a super impressive 933. He raced professionally in the sport for another three years before turning to his current pursuit, ultra distance gravel racing. He's finished in the top 10 at both Unbound Gravel, which is formerly DK200 in Emporia, Kansas and SBT Gravel, all without much fanfare at all. Jesse Moore, welcome to Detention. Thank you, good to be here. We are really happy to have you, yeah, right? Um, that's our, actually our first and most important question. Um, is this your first time in detention? That is a good question. I don't think I spent a lot of time in detention. Um, growing up, we, we moved a lot, so I was often like new kid in school, so I, I was kind of like head down, you know, and learned pretty quickly that I needed teachers as allies as opposed to enemies. So, I, yeah, I, I tried to stay out of detention and, and keep my friends where I could get them at first. Awesome. Yeah, we have uh, we have learned over this year of uh, doing this show that um, uh, Molly and I spent a lot of time in detention, we learned growing I, up. I can see that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Compliment accepted. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of endurance athletes have not. Yeah, well, especially in triathlon. I mean, we're kind of a clean cut crew, aren't we? It's true. It's true. It's part, I mean, kind of discipline, follow, follow the rules, stay between the lines. Certainly, yeah, found, uh, <laughs> certainly the people who've come on this, this interview show, at least, have been pretty clean cut. <laughs> <laughs> um, our other question, we sort of touched on this a little bit when we were warming up. Um, is that over the past year, everybody has been trying to figure out like, how do we deal with this pandemic? Um, what can we do in this space when we normally would have been coaching, racing, all of that stuff? Um, for me and Molly, it was putting this show together. Um, but how have you had to change your, your, um, your job in the past year? Yeah, that's, that's certainly been a challenge. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the very first thing that went away was just everyone's kind of sense of purpose. <laughs> you know, and a lot of us, we, we follow these sports and do these things because it kind of gives structure to the rest of our lives, right? And all of a sudden that's just gone. So this thing that I'm, I'm training for, my North Star has just been removed. So there's that. And then the other big thing that a lot of people lost really quickly was their community, you know, be it going to the pool in the morning or, you know, the group rides on the weekends, whatever that was. So those those two things just evaporate. And so like as a coach, a big part of my job is to kind of like how do I give people purpose again? And kind of how do I try to recreate some sense of community? So, you know, it was a lot of scrambling. I can't say I did it perfectly <laughs> by any stretch, but it was kind of like how do we find some things for people to focus on, be it like pull up challenges or plank challenges, or, you know, I, I had a big group of people do an Everest challenge with me. So we all got on Swift and did, did an Everesting day, you know, just all kinds of stuff like that. And then I did a lot of like group meetups on Swift. So, I mean, basically the background of it all is I like kind of migrated towards the virtual reality stuff that I never thought I was gonna do and resisted for quite a while. Um, and started having workouts on Swift and having people meet up on there, do the discord thing so we could all talk to each other. You know, and a lot of times it was just, you could just hear it in people's voices from the beginning of the ride to the end, like just how much it meant to them just to even talk to some other people, you know, and just recognize everybody was struggling. Because that's the other thing, like with the sport and this, 
kind of this cultural moment right now is everybody thinks like they need to be happy all the time and they're afraid to <laughs> admit when they're not and that they're they're struggling and having some moments of weakness and i think it was just just really good to talk it was good it was good for me to hear them struggling as well you know and then kind of support each other and help and just try to find a way through so that that answer answer your question there a bit yeah i actually have a a follow-up on that have you found a place Mm -hmm. that has been particularly effective in creating community and like virtual environments for athletes is there something that's really worked for you you know beyond the the swift stuff not not as trying to think what else we've done i mean there's obviously kind of the zoom stuff you can check in a little bit but now the the swift stuff has worked pretty well that's probably probably been the main one um, I, I was telling you guys earlier that I, I took all of the workouts that I've built. Obviously, we all have these huge libraries. After 15 years of doing this, I've got a huge training piece library and just took all those, built them all out so they would sync with Swift. So we could all, you know, I could plug them all into calendars. We could all do the rides together if we needed to. You know, those those people that could make it make it happen. That's what it, but yeah, that's that that and just kind of the Discord thing, just that a bit, a bit of communication. I didn't dive probably as deep as I could have, and maybe that will be something that evolves. But I'm also hoping we get to get back to the real thing <laughs> before I have to do too much more exploration on that side. Um, you brought it up, so we're going to go there. Um, Zwift Everesting, um, you have done some very long bike rides. Um, how was Everesting on Zwift in comparison to, say, you know, 200 miles on gravel in the middle of Kansas? Um, I, I'd have to say it was easier. By far, I think a true Zwift or not Zwift, but a true Everesting would be pretty hard because I mean, like you do the Alp Zwift, right? And like you get to get off while your bike, your avatar is descending. And so it's like I got to change my chamois like four times. I had a couple athletes who were starting to have like saddle sores, like go take showers, you know, grab lunch because you've got 10 minutes in there. So you could stretch. I could hit the roller to make sure my knees weren't going to blow out like and stuff. So and it just that's the one side like unbound gravel you know formerly dk it's like the psychological pressure is the hardest part of that whole thing because like you're just trying not to flat if you don't flat you're going to go top 20 sort of (laughs) um but yeah if you have some sort of mechanical or crash which a lot of people did that's 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 the side you're not going to get on a swift sort of everest challenge um physically it was you know it's pretty good but again you're like had control i wasn't trying to race anybody i wasn't trying to set any any time goals. So I just, I was able to keep it pretty moderate pace the whole day. And I, I actually stayed on for, I think, 33,000 feet of climbing in total. So it was because like, I, I wanted to make sure all my other athletes got through it. Right. So I was like going down and picking them up and descending and just making sure we all kind of completed together. Yeah. I think I was on there for like 11 and a half hours to do. And I was done around nine hours, the actual Everesting. Did it, does it make you want to do an outdoor Everesting? Uh, maybe. I'd, I'd need the right environment. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, the, like the times are so good right now. I'm not sure what would draw me to it. Because at some point, some things just become suffering for the sake of suffering. And like, if I'm going to go for that much time, I've only got so many of those in a lifetime that I'm going to, I'm probably going to use it on some like crazy outdoor adventure in the backcountry. You know, on, on, a, on a gravel bike. <laughs> so actually, my next question was about the, the role of adventure. A lot of what you post on your website and uh, and what you speak about in, in the events that you've taken on seems to be in the pursuit of, of adventure. Can you tell us a little bit about what role you think that plays in the athlete experience and in your coaching? Yeah, so I mean, as you both know, it's it's really about keeping people motivated and fueling their, you know, it's popular now, but like their why, you know, and like what draws out their desire to do the work. And I've, I've struggled with some of that myself, you know, coming from like elite athletics and then like making a transition into wanting to stay active and continue to train because I needed to, to kind of ground truth all of my workouts for my athletes. I have to go through them. Um, but to keep myself going, like what is going to keep drawing me to do workouts and and try hard and work hard. And for me, it's kind of been the adventure side of things is what, like, I want to be able to say yes to whatever somebody asked me to go do. Right. So that's been my kind of my, my working mantra the past few years. I always want to be fit enough to say yes to whatever somebody asks. That's, that's kind of what, 
what's worked with that. But I mean, for me personally, like there was a little gap in the intro there, but from when I got my second stress fracture at UC Davis to when I actually started racing a bike was, gosh, that was like an eight year stretch. And that was all rock climbing. And then it was also as a wildlife biologist working Yosemite, Sequoia, Kings Canyon in the backcountry for for that whole period of time. So it's like I would work in the backcountry 12 days to 20 days at a time off trail, you know, and then I'd do that for four months as hard as I could and then go rock climbing all over US and go to Europe and that sort of stuff. So that I think I've got some of that in my just DNA. I've always kind of sought that out. Um, yeah, that's a that's a piece of the intro that I definitely didn't get a hold of. And yeah, uh, yeah that part's you, not on the internet, <laughs> <laughs> but now it is. And yeah. uh, do you think the do you think the rock climbing has that um, has that shown up in your endurance uh, in your endurance racing? Uh, <clears throat> it's probably shown up in the endurance racing, and then just also the coaching. Um, I I had an athlete today tell me, like, just I'm really even keel, and I I don't I don't rise to like drama quickly, any of that kind of stuff. Cause it's just like when you've done that sort of thing and like life and death is a very real possibility and you've had friends die and it's like, you can't panic in situations because like consequences are just too high. I think that's, I've brought that to the coaching kind of relationship. So I'm, I feel like I'm somebody that can buffer like as somebody's having an emotional storm of some kind, good or bad, like I can help them sort of process that and give it back to them in a way that that helps them just kind of smooth it out, right? Smooth out the highs, smooth out the lows, that sort of thing. But does that answer what you're you're getting yeah. at? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, it's it's something that, um, yeah, I wish I'd known. Like that's really cool. Oh. <laughs> I want to know a little about that, a little bit about the other side of the adventure. Then this is triggered for me by um, by the rock climbing I used to climb but I am super scared of heights. Um, so I asked what the role of adventure was, but can you tell us a little bit about what the role of fear is in training for, for athletes or for you? Is there is there like a, an importance or enough fear or? Fear is a weird one. So, I mean, it's, I mean, I was here like military people talk about that. It's like, they don't, they don't say that they don't have it, but they don't let them, let it control them, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a healthy relationship to be had with fear, you know, be it fear of something that's really big, like an Ironman or unbound gravel or like whatever it is. I think that can be a great motivator so long as it doesn't derail you and send you down like this path of self-doubt. Although going down the path of self-doubt and then working through it can be really productive as well. Right. So, you know, I, I, for me, and then I also encourage a lot of my athletes to do this. It's like, if you see something you're afraid of, you know, like it might even be an interview with you guys, right? And it's like, if it's triggering some sort of fear response or any sort of stress like that, like I almost lean towards it. And I encourage my athletes to do that too, because that's where all the growth is gonna happen. You know, it's like, you need that resistance, you need a little bit of fear, you need a little bit of that stress response to like bring you up to your next level and, and get the most out of yourself. You know, that's, that's, where, that, that's where that's found. <laughs> you know, and in bike, bike racing, it was like the scariest moments were uh, that meant you were in the race you're on the sharp end you know and if you're pursuing an iron man and you're super scared of the training and what it's going to take out of you and those dark moments that are going to come i mean go look for them because that's that's where you're going to find out about yourself and and probably be pretty pleased with what you find but to do that you have to be vulnerable to failure so don't don't be surprised if you have that happen too <laughs> but then you have to learn from it move on from it and and go to the next thing um go ahead oh no i was gonna say please do send us all of the athletes who you think would be afraid to talk to us because we would love to talk to them <laughs> <laughs> um speaking of like fear and new things so like you get to graduate school in 2004 um and you said in your bio that you that's where you discovered cycling um i imagine that you didn't go to grad school to pursue cycling you were there for exercise science what was the what was the plan like what were you going to use that exercise science degree for so that was i mean we all have those moments in life and for me that was one of those moments without a plan so i was you know at eleven thousand feet in the back of sequoia kings canyon i think and i was working on an endangered species of frog at the time and i found myself thinking more about like how my body was adapting to the like seven thousand feet with 70 pounds on my back like altitude stuff 
more than I was thinking about the frog. And so I was like, I've got, I need to do something different. So at you know 30 years old, I decided to go back to grad school and that's what drove me back there. And then at grad school, you do all those rotations through different labs. And I walked into, do you get, know who Massimo Testa is, Max Testa? He's in Park City now. He was, he and Eric Hyden were at UC Davis at the time. And I walk in there for my rotation and Chris Horner and like all these pro cyclists that were in there getting tested, super fortuitous. Like I walked in, I sat in on a couple of his post-testing sort of debriefs with the athlete and just like his ability to, to get them to believe in themselves, to get them to believe they were better than they actually were, you know, not like inflating them in any way, but just like really just an amazing ability to do that. And, and a lot of it was just him listening to what they were saying and giving it back to them in a digestible way. Like I just, it clicked. I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing. But yeah, to answer your question, I, did, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew that I was super interested in it. And to back up a little bit, when I finished my undergrad degree, I had a couple of like, units I needed to finish. And a, my roommate at the time said, hey, come do this physiology course with me. And it's like, I'd been struggling to memorize all these genus and species of birds and mammals. Really just did not enjoy it. I take this class, I get an A plus, and it didn't feel like I worked very hard. Right. So it's like I left undergrad kind of knowing that there was this thing, this like easier path forward for me and this thing I was actually more interested in. So kind of long winded answer, but, but that gets gets it done. You love the long winded answer. OK, good. Yeah, it makes our job so much easier. Um, you uh, so you're in grad school, uh, you discover something that you're good at, that you're really into, uh, and then you also get into cycling. Um, but like you said, you were in your early 30s at that point. Um, what are some things that you think sets adults up for success when they get into a new sport or hobby? Hmm. Good. That's a good one. So, I mean, as adults, I think oftentimes by the time they get to that stage, they've figured out like, like how to work, right? and how to kind of organize themselves <laughs> and you know it's like as a kid it's like you almost have too much time on your hands and so it's easy to just not get much done and i think when people come to it kind of growing up I, I had this experience when i went back to grad school i was a much better student than i ever was as an undergrad just you have more structure more maturity and you're you're able to just kind of see the see the, the way forward and, and follow the path a little bit better um but I mean, with that comes a whole bunch of distractions, you know, potential distractions and other things to balance. So you gotta, you gotta be careful with that. Cause some, I will see athletes as adults come to it and they'll try to revert back to being kids, <laughs> you know, and they'll discard all the other commitments they have in their lives in order to chase this one thing. So that's, that's something you really gotta watch with adults sometimes. Generally middle-aged men. Um, I don't see women do that as often, but <laughs> you know, oftentimes the men will let the ego get going a little bit too much and they're, on Strava comparing with their buddies and that sort of stuff. Women definitely do that too. <laughs> yeah. I, I probably just haven't, haven't been exposed to the right ones. So some of the work that you did in, um, in grad school was on testing and on physiological testing. How much of that are you still doing? Do you still rely on that kind of data in the athletes that you're working with? Yeah, that's a good one. So I think that's evolved a lot. Um, you know, I, I have the ability to do lactate testing. I don't have a VO2 sort of testing ability at home at kind of where I do my work. Um, so I, I can farm out the VO2 stuff. I the VO2 stuff for me is again, we, we've all said that but it's like the biggest engine and like how, how much talent have you got is kind of what VO2 tells me. Um, lactate testing, I find a little bit more useful for actual training zones and watching people progress and the, the curve itself can be a bit diagnostic as to we need more anaerobic energy or aerobic, all that kind of stuff, not to get too much in the weeds. Um, but I, I don't do a lot of the testing anymore in part because I've, I've become a smaller coaching business. And so it's like, I have the time to really look and analyze everybody's data all the time. So I feel like I've, I'm kind of seeing it in real time, sort of the adaptations. So I don't necessarily need to do a lactate test every six months to check in with my athlete to see where they're at and if we need to move zones, all that kind of stuff. So it, like if we're if we're really struggling to, to see an adaptation or we don't think the zones are right, we might we might check in with a lactate test. But the other issue is I, I coach people all over the world, right? So it's it's hard for me to like do the test. So I might I might farm it out 
or some of the professionals, you know, they're, they're getting tested regularly just, just because that's part of the job. Um, is there a particular like uh, software analysis that you use? Do you use any KO? Do you just use like the basic training peaks, like Golden Cheetah? Is there something that you go for that helps you do all that analysis? Yeah, so the bread and butter is definitely done on, on training peaks. You know, I, I used to do a lot with WKO, um, but most of the tools are now part of that online platform. Um, and it's just a lot easier. And I, I had a lot of trouble where it's like you're doing stuff in WKO and it wasn't syncing well with training peaks. So I found myself doing double work. So I think not necessarily out of laziness, but a little bit of laziness, not wanting to like repeat a bunch of the stuff. I've, I've migrated mostly towards training peaks, get most of the most of it done there. Cause I'd, most of it is in the comments box anyway, right? It's like you see the numbers and, and analyze the data, but a lot of the relationship is in, in that dialogue box. And I can get most of what I want, you know, right there. And it's really seamless and just, with working with a large group of people, that's I found that to be the best best one. I love what the Golden Cheetah stuff is doing, but that's you know it's I'm not maybe advanced enough to get as much as I can out of that kind of the open source uh, software sort of ideal. So how do you keep that? Uh, you talked a little bit about the communication and the importance of developing relationships. Um, you also said that you have athletes all over the world. How do you feel like the, you develop those relationships? How do you establish the, the initial trust in training? Yeah, that trust is, is hard to come by. Um, so yeah, you've got to earn it. So I, I mean, really, I don't, I don't do any like flashy type things. I just, I get in there with the athlete and it's just the day to day work. So it's like everything they put in there, they're going to get a comment about, they're going to get some sort of instruction if needed. You know, I don't do a lot of like cheerleading <laughs> sort of stuff, but there, there's just a level of engagement that I think brings that trust with it. And it just, it just grows over time. It's like any investment, you know, it just kind of accumulates and you start to get the dividends over time. But it's just, I think there's just a sense of like, okay, I have this thing going on and coach was there. I have this good workout, coach was there. I have this bad workout, coach was there. It's just this, this sense that I'm just kind of there in the background, whether they need me or not, but if they need me, I'm there. Um, and, and so much of that is just being responsive, getting back to people in a relatively quick amount of time and, and just having something to say. And a lot of times it's just listening. And to do that just means me asking questions. So I just have to ask a leading question and then get them to, come forward with what it is that they they really want to tell me anyway you know and i'd say initially probably the bigger issue at first is getting them to actually give me feedback um with some of my athletes they feel like it's complaining <laughs> you know and they don't want to be complainers or or they'll see the things that i do you know obviously my pros are way beyond where i am at but some of my age group athletes it's like they see the stuff i do and they're like i don't want to say this or I was afraid to ride in the rain or that kind of thing until he'd go do it and I don't want to be a, a crybaby about it you know so it's like I have to break those barriers down initially with some people but then once we get that opened up and, and flowing it usually works pretty well yeah a lot of leading questions I think might be the best answer there <laughs> um, speaking of new athletes uh, you have just started working with triathlon superstar Lindsay Corbin um, and uh, she's very excited about it, and um, everybody that is a, a fan of hers is as well. Um, this is kind of one of those odd questions, but like um, when you work with an athlete of that level and that history, um, is there are there any other considerations that you take into account when you begin working with them? Don't screw them up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big one. Um, you know, with an athlete like her, that's really well established. I mean, she's got a long career. And I mean, her former coach, you just look at her results, she, you know, she, he did a great job, right? There's no question about that. So, you know, with somebody like that, it becomes then like, okay, do we kind of try to continue to do what they were doing? Or do we like take a big risk and like completely flip things on their head? You know, any of that kind of stuff. So that's, those are, those are big considerations because at also at that level, I mean, you're talking about good amounts of money and there's like true professionalism and, and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that on, on both sides. So yeah, I need to need to respect what has been done and also not try to recreate the wheel. Right. I mean, they, they figured out a bunch of stuff that works. Really well. 
So you, you definitely want to learn from those. And, and her former coach is super open. He's a great, great guy. He's like no ego. Like we, we've talked a couple of times already and managing that transition. I'm going to talk with him too. Cause yeah, as my own like coaching business, I'm fairly isolated. So any chance I get to interact with other coaches is awesome. I, I learn a ton and hopefully we all learn, learn from each other, create a, a good network, which I, I really enjoy that bouncing, bouncing stuff. Cause there, there's no secret workouts <laughs> as you both know. It's like, if you get a coach that's trying to like hide everything, then I'd, I'd kind of run for the hills on that one. We second that. Um, we uh, we love that one of the things that we love so much about these talks is the chance to get to talk to other coaches and like learn from learn from those folks. Um, are there principles that you have carried with you throughout your your coaching career that you still consider really fundamental that you apply to to all levels of athletes? Wow, um, like physiological principles or sort of like psychological or kind of all of. Honestly, either like if someone asks you to to drill down your coaching style, I guess to a, a few sentences, what would you what would you say? Wow, I should probably do this as an exercise right. and, write this and then down. then put it on your website, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably should. Um, you know, I, probably one of my underlying principles is is kind of that, and it is actually in my tagline, I think, like balancing life and sport. So that's that's probably where I start any relationship is I don't, I just don't want to see people have sport take over their lives. So it's, it's like, it's one box for like these ultra, you know, like Lindsay, or when I worked with Andrew Slansky, like that level of athlete, like I'll let them make some slightly unhealthy decisions in terms of maybe, you know, how hard they're working out or things that are beyond the norm for most people. But for the rest of us, it's like, I just, I want to see people use the sport as sort of metaphor or place to practice life or like this just place that will better them as opposed to take over and start to extract who they are as people and make it worse you know damage their relationships like it's changed in that pandemic i'm really it's really unfortunate but one of the stats i was the most proud of up until this past year was i had no divorces of an athlete that was with me <laughs> right so that's that sort of thing is kind of probably one of my key like number one things is like keep relationships healthy keep the person's life in balance um that's pretty pretty important but then we get to like physiology principle type things and like i'm still a little bit old school with like foundation comes before the high intensity interval hack you know like that sort of stuff so yeah i, I still want to like use some of those traditional things with building a big foundation and then building on top of that all that kind of stuff so i I guess that would be another principle of mine is I'm, I'm not in for the hacks. I'm not in for the shortcuts. I, I've just, I've now been around it long enough to see it all like get repackaged and, you know, keto it was, you know, Atkins before, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> you know, I guess it'd be more like paleo as it used to be Atkins or, or that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Does that answer, answer that? Very much so. That's I, great. I can, I can go in more detail on some of that if you want. Well, I was going to ask you, like, where did some of those, where did some of those fundamentals come from? Like, where are the places that you learned them? Who did you learn it from? And then, yeah, what are some of those fundamentals that really seem to stick for you physiologically? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of it, I think, is the same for all of us in that I, you know, I screwed a lot of it up. <laughs> As an athlete, I, I made a lot of those mistakes, you know, like just chasing it too hard and just discarding everything else in your life, you know risking everything else. Um, and I'm not, to, not to say that you shouldn't do some of that too, but yeah. Yeah. You know, like pushing through injuries, pushing through illness, you know, abandoning work type priorities, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think I've done all of that. Um, and then from like the coaching side of things and some of those like fundamental principles, I was really fortunate to have a, an amazing high school coach. He was actually way better than my, my collegiate coaching, which is probably why I got hurt so much in college. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he won a bunch of California state championships, all that kind of stuff, but he was just really good at answering the questions that we had as to why we were doing what we were doing. And so like those fundamentals of endurance and base building and like how you sort of structure things. And then probably more important than anything was just communicating that to the athlete and getting us to believe that it would work. Cause as we all know, it's like following a training plan you believe in is going to get you way farther than following the perfect plan, you know, like 70% of the way. So it's like 
a bad plan is way better than no plan <laughs> or, or the perfect plan not followed followed at all so i would like to know a little bit more about the uh, the athletic experience um of the coach so we alluded to this in your intro but you have done a lot of cool stuff you've done ultra distance gravel racing and ultra running and swim run and Triathlon, is there an athletic achievement that you're most proud of or one that you that you point to when you're like, I did that? <laughs> oh, wow, that's a good one. You know, it's like, that's weird. So, I mean, some of the stuff I've done doesn't appear on a results sheet that, you know, I'm the most proud of. So, like, my my wife and I and some friends a couple years ago, we did, you know, like, we did the Boston Marathon, and then a couple weeks later, we went and did rim to rim to rim in the Grand Canyon, so across the canyon and then back. So I, I forget how many miles that was, but, you know, that was that was probably one of the things I, I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> really enjoyed that, and I didn't set any records or anything like that, but just to, like, take that on and to stand at the canyon's edge and then look across and be like, well, tomorrow, I guess I'm running across there and back, and then that following day to have done it, that, that sort of stuff is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then some of the like gravel adventure things that I've done just in training, those are, those are probably some of my favorite moments. You know, my favorite thing is just like a couple of good friends going out into the woods, good potential for having huge mechanicals and getting lost and eaten by bears and, and coming through it somehow. You know, it's like, I'm pretty famous for my winter rides or we're going to go find snow, um, which is harder to do down here than it is probably up in, in Bend would be, but you know, it's like, we're going to ride up until we find snow. And those are just some of the best days, you know, six, seven hours, you're riding on ice, you're falling down, you're laughing, you're throwing snowballs at each other, you know, like that sort of stuff that, that never gets seen, you know, it never shows up on a result sheet. Those are, those are probably some of my favorites. But yeah. I mean, the, the DK experience was pretty amazing. Um, you know, the Ironman stuff, to be honest, like my favorite Ironman was like Placid where I, I was awful. I mean, I think it was the worst one I ever had. I think it was like five and a half hours maybe for the run because I was like cramping and stomach stuff. But that's probably my favorite Ironman and my best memory of it because I, by doing that, I was no longer up in the front where everybody's kind of like, just their faces are closed off and they're not, they're not getting, I shouldn't say they aren't getting, but the experience is very different. For me, Ironman represented what I actually found when I got back farther in the field like that community, that camaraderie. It's like, I'm like cheering somebody on and I pass them and then I'm like tramping on the side of the road and then they're cheering me on. And then like a mile later, like they're throwing up in the bushes or like running into the porta potty and we're like hitting each other on the back and being, you know, just really encouraging. And like that captured like the Ironman spirit that I'd gotten attracted to in the first place. Um, and just for whatever reason, I end up kind of more towards the front where it's a little bit different. So that was, that's the kind of thing that I look for. Because, yeah, I'm super introverted and closed, but at the same time, I really love community. I love being around people and, and kind of being part of that and, and helping people elevate their game. How about on the coaching side of things? Is there a coaching accomplishment of which you're the most proud? Oh, man. Yeah, if we, if we look at results, I had a week at the Tour of California a few years ago where it's like, I was coaching Evan Huffman at the time. He won two stages and Andrew Kalansky at the time, he won another stage. So I like, I won three of whatever, not I won, but you know, my athletes won three of the seven stages of the Tour of California, you know, and Evan was in two breakaways to, to win those, which was, was pretty awesome. I mean, that was a good week. And then I was coaching Chris Jones at the time too. And he was, you know, he was in every break for that week. So that was, I want to be hard, hard to beat, but you know, it's like Andrew also won the Dolphin A you know, he's talked on the tour a couple times. That's like stuff like that, you know, and Evan was national champion and I, yeah, there are a lot of national champions. That sort of stuff has been really good, but you know, then mixed in with those moments are, are amateur athletes that didn't think they could do an Ironman, you know? And it's like, you work with them and get them the confidence and the belief and then support them the whole way. And then like, they freaking do the thing, <laughs> you know, and they're crying at the finish line and like that sort of stuff. Like, to be honest, that, that means as much as winning the Dolphin A. You know, that's it's like it doesn't have all the same accolades, but like the, the essence of it is the same. So it's like some people go faster, some people go slower, but like what they all go through and like the process and the evolution, it's it's so similar across the board. You you both see this all the time. And that 
that's what I do it for. You know, I love, I love just being part of that. I don't really care how fast the person is, like what, what result they're going to get. But if they're willing to do the work and embrace that change and that, that process of evolution and getting better, that's, that's the thing I want to be part of. Like that's what I get my hooks into. Can you tell us a bit about what led you to swim run? Um, we do so much of our sport as individual athletes, uh, at least as triathletes. What led you to a partner sport and follow up on that? What makes a good partner for swim run? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, my, my buddy just said, hey, do you want to do this? And again, going back to what we talked about earlier, I just wanted to be fit enough to always say yes to stuff. So, um, yeah. I just was like, yeah, that sounds great. And it was up in the Orcas Island, and I, I love the sound, especially that time of year, kind of that September, October time frame when it's like it's not raining, it's perfectly sunny. It's like probably the most idyllic place in the world, <laughs> besides like Kentucky or the East Coast when the leaves change. That's another one of my favorites. But yeah, so he, he wanted to do it, and I was game for it. Um, and the adventure side of it, and, and just something different. That was all, yeah, I checked all the boxes for me. So that, that drove me to it. You know, and, and for the partnering up part, that that is a tricky one. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but like you really do want to try to find a balance between run speed and swim speed. You know, the swim is probably a little easier because the stronger swimmer, you can get the draft and all that kind of stuff or even get pulled by the tether. But like the run, if you're not well matched running, it, it can end up being a little frustrating for one of the partners. And then the other partner is probably going to feel bad because they're holding him back, that sort of stuff. So yeah, the run I would try to find to be to be pretty well matched if you can. Um, but it, it's just another one of these sports, though, that it's your experience. It's whatever you want to make out of it. So if you want to race it, it's available. Same with gravel racing. It's like if you want to race it, go race with the pros and go as hard as you want. That's there. But then there's there's this whole opportunity to just go enjoy the day with a friend. You know, and if you don't want to be competitive and you don't need to be perfectly evenly matched and, you know, just go enjoy the day because they're all of them are just in amazing places. And it's like the ultimate four wheel drive vehicle, right? You're just like running along and you come to a water body and you jump in and you swim across it. <laughs> you get out on the other side and you maybe are on a trail or maybe not and go do some four wheeling and then you get to another water body and swim across that. And it's just so cool. Like the year I did the Orcas Island one, I'd done the DK. I've done the the multi-day stage race, gravel stage race out of Bend, but I'm spacing the name on right now. Did all these great events, but that, that Orcas Island thing was probably my favorite of the year, just because it was so different. For one, you didn't have to pack a bike and fly with a bike, which was, <laughs> I really, really liked that part. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was so cool. And and the people are, are incredibly welcoming. You know, it's it's got that early days of triathlon feel still, where it's like really grassroots. You know, and it's like the registration lines aren't the same. It's not like blaring music at the start line, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just very like, like I said, yeah, like grassroots. So all that stuff's great. Um, when we met in Steamboat, um, I think, you know, a few weeks after that, I sent you an email and was like, hey, there's this Wadi team. I think you would be a good um, member of it. And you replied with an answer that, that just completely blew me away. You were like, that's, you said that you found that things like that um, led you to kind of chase ego. And I was wondering if you would talk about the role that ego has played for you in like a positive and a negative way in your career. Yeah, I mean, that's another one of those things that I think I've, I've, made the mistakes with so i've learned a lot from it and evolved with it um because yeah early on i mean we all have it and i'm now at a place where i'm, I'm learning to have a healthy relationship with the ego because i think i had it and i chased you know kind of stoking it too much and that left me feeling really empty and so i went to it then from there i went to a place where i was like i wanted to just like squash it and not have an ego and try to be some like buddhist monk or something but now I've, I think I'm at a place where I, I can have a healthy relationship with it because it, it is part of your identity. And then I also think like fear, like we talked about earlier, it's a, it's a really useful tool to like get you to go do things, you know, that are, are productive and positive. And, and I also think it's okay to like hold your space, right? And, and all that stuff. I don't know if I'm using the psychological terms right, but like ego is part of that, like owning who you are, 
you know, being happy with it and owning your space and holding a place in the world, that's all, that's all ego. And I think it's okay to, to have that. Um, but you can't let it like be the only thing and the only, you know, making it super shiny and polished all the time can't be the thing that drives you all the time. Um, yeah, I, did, I, did I get to that? Totally, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I have a quick follow-up in yeah. how, when you, when you see your athletes um, dealing with ego in perhaps non-helpful ways, are there techniques you have to help them through that? Hmm. Yeah, again, asking a lot of questions. Yeah, I have a, I think I have a way of asking questions that will get them to think about it in a roundabout way and like come to the same answer <laughs> that I'm, I'm trying to drive at. Um, Cause yeah, it's a lot of kind of like a, an exercise you can do sort of, you know, they're up against that, they're struggling with their ego or they don't want to do something because they, there's that vulnerability that the ego will get crushed. And so they're kind of like backing away from it and you see them doing that. And so you go through this exercise. I think I actually heard Matt Dixon do this, so I'm not going to take credit for it. But it's kind of like, okay, why don't you want to do X, Y, or Z? And they'll tell you. And then you're like, okay, so that happens. Then what? You know, and then they'll be like, well, blah, 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 blah. And then you're like, okay, then what? You know, it's like, what? And try to get them to the fact that, like, you strip all that stuff away and all those failures happen that they're afraid of. Like, what's there at the end? You know, and they're, they realize, like, they're totally fine. <laughs> You know, there's not, there's no real trauma or damage that's going to be done. They are still there. They're totally fine. Their family still loves them. I'm still going to care about them. You know, it's like, in fact, I'm going to be even more invested because I saw them like take this on and, and expose themselves and, and really go for it. So that, you know, just try to give them a lot of like positives that come, come with taking that on and, and not letting their ego get crushed, be the deterrent from, from taking on a challenge. I'm going to, we have a question in chat that I'm going to, I'm going to take a spin on, um, to, uh, to, for the next question, kind of piggybacking off of that. So this is a new person to us. Hi Brent. Um, and he wants to know if you feel that running is not meant for everyone, meaning a 250 pound man shouldn't run on concrete. Um, what I would like to know, kind of piggybacking off of that is what you recommend to athletes who may feel that, um, they wouldn't belong in the place that they that they would like to to get into like if there's a fear of getting hurt or a fear of looking silly um for newer athletes or for people who are thinking about taking on a new sport do you have any recommendations on on how to how to go about that in a way that is healthy and safe wow. um yeah, there's kind of two parts to that because I've been injured a lot with running, so I often run up against that where I'm like, man, maybe I'm just not meant to run. Like this is, I should do these other things instead. Um, and and if I'm fortunate enough that a bunch of other things that don't hurt me give me a lot of joy, so I can I can chase those, and that's I get everything that I want out of running. I can get somewhere else, so it's it's really useful. I mean, triathletes were the best multi-sporters. You know, kind of everything get hurt in one, do do the other two more. Um, so for me, I mean, you know, maybe not everybody is meant to run, but that doesn't mean you don't be an athlete and it doesn't mean that you don't try to find those, those kind of what you get out of running or that you're looking for with running in a different place. So I, I think that's maybe one part and you'd be taking a hard left turn probably there, you know, but if, if you, if the running's the thing you want to do, and that is the thing you're passionate about and for it be a community or whatever it is, that's kind of drawing you there, then yeah, it's just gotta be again, keeping that ego a little bit quiet and not looking at the social media and how much everybody else is doing, but being very grounded in what you are capable of and what your limitations are and respecting them highly and and not overstepping what, what your body's going to allow you to do based on what other people can do. Because you're definitely gonna run up against that a lot and it will only lead to, to injury and general unhappiness. <laughs> You know, there's no real better way to say it than that because it's being hurt sucks. And and if you can do five weeks of running at 20 percent of what you want to be doing and you can do all five weeks and get to the end of that five weeks healthy, you're in a much better place than you would have been doing one or two weeks of what you think you should be able to do or what somebody else is able to do and getting hurt and then spending three weeks doing PT and all that other stuff. It's just 
it's, it's just it's a hard cycle to be in so that's that's probably the the main thing is is be very respectful of what your limitations are and and don't don't push beyond them for any other reason than than yourself and i mean honestly it's a little bit self-serving but get a coach <laughs> you know or at least somebody you can bounce it off of or just have really honest conversations with you if, if my friend came to me and told me they were going to do this what would i say to them you know i'm going to increase my mileage by 20 miles this week you know what would i tell my friend if they came to me with that so that would be what was the problem that's yeah what's probably the best advice i can give um so you have lived in the cycling world, the triathlon world, the ultra running world, the swim run world. Um, you cross a lot of lines in sport. There is a unfortunate and longstanding divide between triathletes and cyclists. Um, why do you think this is and what do you think we can do to fix it? Wow. Um, yes, I need some sort of ambassadorship for this, I guess. Um, yeah, that that's that's a very real thing. Um, I mean, some of it maybe is earned, some of it's not. But to be honest, it's one of the one of the parts that drove me away from cycling was that like I mean, cyclists can just I don't know how much cussing you can do on here, but they're just they can be not the most welcoming people, <laughs> you know. And and what insert whatever words you want there. Um, and you know the thing walking away from it a bit and then coming back to it again and being faced with like mass starts and all that kind of stuff and just the chaos of bike racing again i now kind of recognize where it's coming from and, and a lot of it's fear you know it's like in cycling like that danger is so real and so intense and it's like within a moment you know i've been racing along at tour Gila and it's like next thing i know some guy's unconscious next to me and he's ended up with a broken femur and he's been you know medevaced out and you know i've had friends that have died and all that sort of stuff has happened so that the danger is super, super present, super real. And so I think a lot of guys, I, I haven't worked with as many professional women, but I, I've noticed with the guys, they go to this place of ego and like raw and like, they just try to overpower it with like this false confidence and this false bravado, which is really off putting for most of the rest of the world. And they're just not always that pleasant to be around. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you're really butting up against this ego that on some level, I think all of us can sense is not genuine. You know, it's not real. You, you tear that down a little bit and they're, they're super insecure and they're super scared. They're super afraid. And or you'll you know, side tangent, but like, you'll see this in the Belgian classics in the spring. It's like, guys, will start putting on weight, you know, and all that's like, for me, looking at it as a physiologist, I'm like, that's a cortisol response. Like they're just living in fear of those crosswinds, the cobbles, narrow roads. It's like at any moment, it's like their career could be over or at the very least, they're going to be in a ton of pain. You know, it's like, Andrew went top 10 on the tour and we were stoked because he only crashed three times, right? You know, and these are hard crashes, <laughs> but that's just like, that's part of the job. So I think I think that's where cyclists end up building that wall because it's kind of this like protective mechanism, you know, hiding behind the ego of it. And like, I'm not afraid, you're afraid, like that sort of thing. You know, and then the triathletes are just, it's, it's just a different experience. And I have found it to be a much more welcoming community, you know, more supportive, more open, there's certainly the same, some of those same personalities are there, especially as some of the cyclists have gone over there. But, you know, for the most part, it's, it's just a completely different experience. But yeah, it's, it's all, I don't know, it's kind of based on nonsense. Cause I, I haven't met a triathlete who can't learn to handle their bike. You know, it's not a, it's not a, that they can't, they just haven't had to, you know, it's like they can learn it all the same. I, I teach people all the time how to handle their bikes better. You know, it's just, but their sport doesn't demand like, bunny hopping curbs and you know or other riders or any of that stuff a lot of it's straight line type stuff so it's just experience it's not inability it's just lack of experience well we will work on getting some sort of like ambassador medal that you can wear around <laughs> to your events or a coat a jacket some sort of ambassador oh, jacket. jacket yes yeah we'll, yeah we'll we'll make that happen for you probably some sort of sash i think part of that all right, now we're, we've got it. We got a jacket, a sash, some medals. We're, we're working on this. I, the vision is beginning. It's perfect. Um, tell us what you think one of the biggest, uh, biggest mistakes that endurance athletes make is, um, or the most frequent. I don't know the biggest. <laughs> either. You can choose either. <laughs> uh, overtraining. Pretty, you know, just too much. I, you know, and especially 
I see it more with athletes. The cyclists do it as well. Runners, runners just get limited by mechanical stresses. You know, they'll they'll try to overtrain. They certainly would love to do it, but they often just get hurt and break down. But you know, with the low impact side of cycling and triathlon, with the swim and the and the bike, I mean, you can just fit so much in and not get that like severe muscle soreness and and the stress fractures and all that kind of stuff that'll normally tell you to stop. So I just, I see people really dig themselves into holes. You know, it's, it, to be open about it, it's like, it's something that Lindsay and I are actually going to be probably arm wrestling over a little bit. Cause she's had years and years of like 30 hour plus weeks. And, I, you know, I, I am very curious. And again, I don't want to tear down everything that has been done before this brought her a lot of success, but I, I just, I, somewhere in my head is this twitch of like, man, I wonder if she could be a little fresher and if maybe that's the breakthrough point. You know, and also there's years and years of doing this big volume. Maybe, maybe we reduce that a little bit and, and sharpen it up. Um, but yeah, for most, most, I think they, they just do too much. That, that more is more philosophy is, is pretty rampant in it. I know a lot of us are a little bit broken in the head, right? So we're quieting our demons by overworking the demons so that they're so tired they can't yell at us anymore. <laughs> you know, and that's it's like it's this sort of self medication thing that goes on. But yeah, that's probably the biggest one. And then everybody talks about this, but the whole like, they go too hard on their easy days, too easy on their hard days, that sort of stuff. So you hear about that all the time. So common mistakes, but yeah, I've seen all that, that same thing. So probably, probably the two biggest mistakes I see. What about for coaches? What are we responsible for? What, what are the mistakes that we make? <laughs> um. You know, probably not listening enough. It'd probably be the first one that comes to mind. So like probably the biggest pitfall we come into is we close off because we start to think we know it all, especially after a few years. You know, it's like you kind of understand how it's going to work. You know, the X's and O's of how to put it up on the training plan, all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, you just you kind of stop listening to those subtle cues, you know, that, that tell you that that X and O thing that's working for all these other people just isn't going to be quite right. And you know, the big one is, is related to the fatigue we just talked about. You know, you're not picking up on those like subtle mood changes or those things that are going to tell you that this, this person's overworking. And even though it looks great on paper, like you need to ask some deeper questions about like, okay, they're fighting with their spouse or you know, it's like their whole life bucket is overfilling over on the side here. You're not even seeing because you're not, you're not asking those questions. And by asking questions, that's you listening. Um, and you're, you're missing some stuff with that, you know, you're not, ser- you're not serving them as well as you could be. Um, what else do we do? Other things I see people do, there's kind of this push now. And I think a lot of it's because of not necessarily the, Z- the Zwifts, but like the Pelotons and the, all these cl- kind of class engagements in which people are really trying to be, they're being asked to be entertainers as much as they are coaches. And so I, I see several of us kind of going down this path where it's like, we're trying to make all of our work as entertaining, as opposed to necessarily the best thing for the athletes to make, make the next progress jump. You know, and it's like some of that stuff that's gotta be done, those fundamental steps are not sexy. They're not entertaining. They're like, you're gonna go do four times 15 minutes at zone three and it's gonna suck. <laughs> it's just gonna be kind of a grind. You know, and I, I see people trying to do this thing where they're like, they're jumping around because they always want to keep it engaging and like be a little different than the past workout. And they're not, they're losing that sense of progression from week to week to month to month because they're doing this like pick from here and here and here because they don't want the people to get bored, you know? And that's, that's a mistake I see some people making, you know, in terms of progression and progressive overload and kind of those fundamentals of, of physiology, you know, and that's, I don't think they're going to be at, at the level you folks are at obviously because successful athletes aren't going to, aren't going to thrive in that environment, but I do see people going that way. Oh, and then I'll, I'll bring up one more. Sorry. Um, I, one that's kind of emerging right now too, and it's kind of that hack culture, growth science sort of thing is pushing a little bit too far towards individualization and losing kind of the fundamentals of like how physiology works. So like people are getting so focused on like making sure the person is being treated like such an individual that they're getting the, you know, like they need 25 milligrams of magnesium and this other athlete needs 29 milligrams of magnesium, 
you know, or they need like seven minutes of threshold work and this other person needs 12 minutes of threshold work and like trying to make it just too, too specific to the people and like then losing like the, the big ticket items, right? Like drilling down so far on these like really complicated mechanisms that they're, they're losing like, well, you need this many hours of base type in zone two type work before we can even talk about that like half a percent difference is going to be made by by dialing in that kind of stuff you know and then yeah here i go so even more so <laughs> the other thing i see a lot of coaches doing is kind of like feeding into this orthorexia thing you're familiar with that term i haven't like heard that this, again it's, it's related to sort of the hack culture but people trying to do everything perfect like eat the exact perfect foods and get the right superfoods and like they're so just obsessive compulsive about like getting all that in that again they're losing like the big ticket items by focusing and drilling down on these little tiny things and i see coaches and and folks like that they they try to sell that and become, create this dependency with the athlete because it's like they make it so complicated that the athlete feels like the only way they can understand it is to keep the coach involved and then the coach is kind of has this like feed forward revenue stream coming from that by you know selling the product of confusion and making it just complicated enough the athlete doesn't feel like they can ever understand it on their own you know and that to get back to principles again for me as a coach i want my athletes to not need me anymore at some point you know if i can we're teachers, you know, if we can teach them to do it on their own, but they want to stay with us just because they like the relationship and they love being on this journey with a person that they can tell about their, their details of their workout. That's not their spouse who doesn't want to hear about it anymore. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I want out of that. Um, one of the quotes on your website, and this is probably where we'll wrap up. Um, you did great. You talked for an hour straight. Your, your, your wife is wrong. Uh, you <laughs> talk for an hour easily. Um, but one of the quotes on your site that both of us latched onto was, uh, don't blame bad luck for things that could have been prevented through be better preparation. Always look back at root causes and change the things that could have prevented your bad luck. Can you tell us a little bit where that came from? And that came from bike racing probably is where, yeah, that, that was rooted in that. Cause it's just like, you come back to the parking lot after the race and you're just listening to this like nonstop monologues from all over the parking lot of like, oh, I would have had it, but I flatted or, you know, my chain broke or I, my gears didn't shift or, you know, I, I could have done it, but I didn't, I didn't eat enough or I bonked or like I cramped and like, but, and it, it would just stop there. It's like they found this thing, this external thing to blame rather than looking internal, internally at the things they had control over. Blame the external. they got their scapegoat. They can go home, feel good about it. But then it's like the same person is having the same conversation three weeks later in the same, you know, a different parking lot at a different corporate criterion, wherever it might be. But it's just like it's just repeating itself. Um, so it's, yeah, it's like taking that moment to self-reflect and own your mistakes. You know, a lot of people don't want to do that either. But yeah, looking looking at what what happened that caused that to happen. And it might have been five steps before the thing that actually took you out of the race. You know, it's like cramping. You know, you didn't start eating 15 minutes into the race. That was like way early. Most people won't look that far back. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I meant by that. You know, it's like running, running the super lightweight racing tire at Kona you know, like that sort of thing. And then you flat and you're like, oh, poor me. But, you know, it's like, yeah, you probably should have run a sturdier tire. There's a lot of sharp stuff on that road. You know, that, that kind of just forward thinking and trying to trying to be a bit of a chess player with it. Understand it at a, at a deeper level. I love awesome. that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much stuff that we do have control over. I feel like we get stuck in the like victim mentality of like, oh, this stuff went wrong. And you're like, nah, some of it you went wrong. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you so much for taking some time out of your Tuesday night to join us all the way from Northern California. It has been awesome to spend some time talking to you and to, to get to know a little bit about where you're coming from. Um, we love these conversations and this has been a really fun one. So thank you for joining us here on In Detention. <laughs> Um, for those of us who are joining us on Twitch, make sure you come back again for Yoga with Amy VT tomorrow at a 6.30, no, 7.30 a.m. on Wednesday and our 6.30 a.m. Thursday Zwift Ride, all about that community. Um, and Jesse, thank you. We hope you'll come back and talk to us again soon. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a ton of fun. Thank awesome. you. It's been fun for us too. Thank, Thank so you much. so much. Bye guys. Bye.